Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. We are a small but powerful group. Our topic is case flow and workflow management. And the materials I am presenting, as Erica mentioned, are in the app. I've got, with this session, I have two additional handouts that should also be in the app. And for those of us with eyesight that may not decipher some of the finer print, I invite you to take a look at the materials on the app, in the app. This is a session that is content from one of the NACOM core competencies, that of case flow management and workflow management. And so for those who are interested in participating in the core champion program, there's also a document posted in the app where after we complete the course, you can look at that and complete and answer a structured question about what you got from the course or how you're going to apply content from this course. So I would also invite you to make sure you look at that if you're interested in participating in the Champion Program. And remember, the Champion Program is one whereby uh, NACOM members can attend sessions on the core competencies and then get recognized through a certificate of attendance and you can do that for all of the competencies. So this is the second conference, I think, that has rolled out this program. I'm looking at Kelly over here. And so that's just one more venue so that NACOM members can take advantage of the material that's out there. OK. Our topic is case flow management, case flow and workflow management. I hope that you are all believers in this to the degree that I am. I will start by saying case flow management has been part of my court life from day one, way back before the 80s <laughs> when I started in courts. At the time, I did not understand the importance or the presence of doing case flow practices. But my very first job involved paying attention to what was happening in the flow of cases thus my love for the topic. This is part one of this series today. Part two will follow immediately after. So in this part, we are going to, and here's where the fine print is difficult to read, we are going to cover some introductory material. We are also going to um, review all of the basics about proven case flow practices, uh, explaining each. Throughout our time together, I want to invite you to think about your court, your environment, your organization. How can you use this content? How can you apply what we have presented here? This content comes from the NACOM curriculum on case flow and workflow, but I've sprinkled in some personal experience and some personal knowledge about how to use the case flow fundamentals. So throughout, I invite you to evaluate and assess and think about, could I do some of these things? Where is my court already doing some of these things? Where can we improve, et cetera. I also want to invite questions and feedback. I've got some things I will ask you to do. And so I invite, if you want, in addition to posting on chat, if you want to stop me, raise your hands, have us discuss some element of case flow management, I invite you to do that. And I have also asked Erica if something comes up on the chat from our virtual attendees, we want to respond to your comments and ideas as well. So questions and discussion throughout. What do you want to know about case flow management? What do you wonder about it? What doesn't make sense? Here is a picture of all of the core competency topics. For those who are familiar with this, this should look familiar with what you've seen. There are 13 different competencies. We are tackling case flow and workflow. 
which is right over here under the area called practice. In other words, practicing things that operate courts. You know, we all bring a different perspective to how to use case flow practices, what they mean, why they're important. So to illustrate that, I'm going to say a series of words. When I say them, I want you to think about, if you have a piece of paper, old style, I want you to jot down what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say each one of these words. I'm going to say each word, ask you to either remember or jot what your first thought is. And for those participating virtually, I invite you to do the same. Then after I've said all the words, I want to get what your answers are to those words. So are we ready? Remember, I'm going to say the word, remember for yourself or jot down what's the first thing that comes to mind. First word is case flow. Next word, leadership. Next word, effectiveness. Next word, challenge. And our last word, change. I've given you five words. Your task is, what was the first thing that came to mind when you heard that word? So I'd like now to call, ask you to shout out what came to mind, starting with case flow. Yell it out. Fun. Fun. Oh, I like that one. Who else? Organization. What? What? Organization. Organization. Good answer. Essential. Essential. Good one. Anyone else? Backlog. Backlog. <laughs> Backlog. And again, for our virtual participants, be thinking about this. What comes to mind when you heard these words? OK, I'm going to the next word. It was leadership. What comes to mind? Vision. 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 Any other takers? Necessary. Necessary. Lead by example. Lead by example. Very good. OK, what? Efficiency came through the chat, yes. OK, the next word I said was effectiveness. Humility. What com Humility? Very good. Humility? What else? If I say the word effectiveness, what comes to mind? Productivity, thank you. Efficiency. OK, I'm going to go to the next word, challenge. What came to mind? What? Obstacles, yeah, yeah. obstacles. What? Training. Training, and up here, Christopher? I said difficulty, which is obstacles. Difficulty, right. Opportunity. Opportunity, yes. Okay, are we ready for the last word? Change, what comes to mind? Pardon? Inevitable. Inevitable, the only thing that likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. <laughs> Overcoming, yes, thank you virtual participants. Scary. Scary, yes. Okay, this was a very simple exercise. I said the same words to each of you, but we had different responses, right? We each come to this content on case flow practices with a different perspective. We each bring our education, our training, the culture from our organization, those will affect case flow practices. Those will be affected by case flow practices. The title of this course is Case Flow and Workflow Management. And here is a slide that gives a super simple definition. Case flow management is the process of paying attention. Paying attention to what happens in the flow of cases paying attention to case volumes, paying attention to maybe even events, paying attention to time and deadlines. Case flow management is nothing other than paying attention. Workflow management relates to all of the processes, 
protocols, maybe even resources needed that allow you to do case flow management. When I was a baby court employee, my job was to read court documents and update the court record as to the status of the case, following a judge's ruling, following a court event, or whatever, to update the status of the case. Well, for many, many months, I just wrotely read documents, looked at files, updated the court's record. Years later, I realize that was the process of paying attention. What's the next event? How much time is passing? How many cases are at different stages of their life? That is what case flow management is all about. And for purposes of our time today, these two are going to blend together. Case flow and workflow management are essentially the same thing. The processes, the procedures, the resources, the actions needed to help cases move through the system. Let's take a look at a document I have provided for you. This is included in the app. The print is very small up on the screen, but I want you to consider this document as a way to evaluate how your court is doing on case flow management. I'm going to go through this very briefly. This is titled the GROW Worksheet. And GROW, G for goal, R for reality, O for options, and W for way forward or the will to do it. The GROW Worksheet. This comes from great material from a gentleman named Alan Fine and others have written about this as well. You can find the resources listed on the bottom or the references on the bottom of this form that's in your app or Google the term GROW. Again, it's G-R-O-W and this worksheet is set out so that as we go through this material, you can use this as a structure to ask yourself, what's my goal related to case flow management? If I am going to take actions, what's the reality in my court, in my organization, in our justice system? And I've broken reality down into both current strengths and current challenges or weaknesses. In some of your answers to the one words, there were things like challenge, obstacle, impediment, right? So this is a form where you would make notes for yourself about what are the things you are currently facing. Next area of this is O, options. This relates to asking yourself, what are my options? What are our options? What can we consider? Even what can we create as an option? And this is where you would note that on this form. Lastly, W, way, what's the way forward or will? How can we get the will to do this? This is what I lovingly call the GROW worksheet. You will see this several times through our time together in the session today, and I make it available for you to use as a structure to actually make notes for actions when you go back. If you don't have it pulled up, improvise. Pretty easy, G-R-O-W. So this is part of what I want you to do to evaluate and assess case flow practices. Working directly from content out of the NACOM core competency on case flow management, we're going to quickly review some of the background that led to case flow practices. And we will cover purposes, the history, and just a little bit about the court environment. All of this content is sizable enough that for actual learning, it would be a two to three day course. We're doing it in 75 minutes. So fasten your seat belts. As part of the background, we come to the purposes of courts. 
by a show of hands, for those of you who have heard this concept or title, please raise your hands. Have you heard of the concept of purposes of courts? Not everyone has their hand up. This is material that's been out for many, many years. What you see in front of you is a list of eight purposes of courts. They were penned by the founder of the Institute for Court Management and a law school dean and a consultant named Ernest Friesen. This list of purposes is also included in a video that is available on YouTube. Very instructional and informational. You should see here eight different purposes ranging from do individual justice in individual cases to number eight, separate convicted people from society. This list of purposes is part of the foundation of understanding case flow management because the management of cases allows courts to do these purposes, to deliver individual justice, to deliver the perception of individual justice, to protect litigants from the arbitrary use of governmental power, etc. This is a very well-known list of purposes. I certainly commend you to go look at the video. Google Ernest C. Friesen Purposes of Courts. It's about 19 minutes long. He expands and expounds on each one of these purposes. For our purpose today, this is useful to remind us that these purposes underlie case flow practices. And many courts also use these purposes to align their operations, to remind themselves or double check why they're doing some operational aspect. Courts use this to link to their mission statements, their vision statements, maybe even in strategic plans. If you don't have a mission or vision statement or a strategic plan in your court, that's OK. But think about this list. Maybe you want to create one working off some of the concepts in this list. These are what we call the traditional purposes of courts. Here is a new list. In recent years, our colleagues and consultants and researchers have published additional purposes. Some of them are new. Some of them perhaps reword content from the first group of purposes. On this list are things like preserving order, or things like promoting public trust and confidence in courts, reconciling relationships, protecting individuals. And I like number E up here, develop the law and clarify principles and conflicting rulings. Some of our courts have that as their express purpose, right? And lastly, demonstrate accountability for the effective and efficient use of public resources. These additional purposes remind us about the public's expectation of courts and the public perception of courts. Both these lists are combined on this page and again, this is a set of ideas and concepts and principles that courts that really are proactive find ways to link their operations to these purposes and find ways to remember why they do certain things because of these purposes. Do we have anything that's come through on chat that I need to think about? I'll keep going. You stop me if you want to, Erica. These then are the purposes of courts. Additionally, for background, case flow management grew up because before the 1970s, courts were not as formally structured. There was an increase in external dominance or control or influence over how courts operated. There was perhaps a less than professional way of conducting the business of the courts. The bullet point up here even mentions disorganization and inefficiencies. 
That led to growing case delays. That led to problems from population growth and increases in court filings. I'm thinking back to my early days where we would have a uh, influx of medical malpractice cases. These all affect and are affected by case flow practices. Now on the bottom right hand side of this slide are the reactions to some of those problems that brought us to where we are today. The US Supreme Court recognized there's a need for professional competence and administration. The state court systems followed. The American Bar Association weighed in on the importance of case flow and the importance of managing and limiting delays. In other words, there was increased attention for the court to be responsible for managing cases. Increased professionalization, and we have a comment or a question? The question on the chat is what unit? Is that the four-letter way terms that you What year? So the overall background started to percolate in the 70s when there was recognition of volumes and backlogs. These other things, like the Supreme Court creation of administration, that played out in the 70s and 80s. Then time standards came, and I'm not being precise on the time, but it was an evolution, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. We, in the business, began to create these structures that defined how can we be better at case flow management. Was there anything else from chat? I would invite those who are interested to go look on the National Center for State Courts website with this kind of timeline question because there is historical background and I would invite you to go into the actual NACOM competency on case flow management because it has been a continuum, an actual timeline building upon concepts and laying out expectations ranging from creating a cadre of people like us that can manage the court to asserting goals and timelines and deadlines, and creating methods to count so we know how we are performing. So this is the background. Let's also take recognition that the court environment itself and the culture in the court influences. And so here's a short list of things that also affect case flow management. On this list, the structure of the court, the governance of the court, how is it led, what are the chains of authority, what are the chains of command, that plays a role. The size of court, the type of court, what the culture is in the organization, and what the local legal culture is. In other words, what's the bar and the lawyers, what are their common practices? Their practices, their expectations can affect case flow as well. Last here, but not at all least, is the influence of partners, other members in the justice system. They are part of the arena when we are thinking about case flow practices. I would add to this list, it's not represented on the slide, what's your staffing? Are you understaffed? Do you have specialized staff? Do you have certain staff that work in the courtroom, certain staff that work in the back room, certain staff that work at the counter, you know, whatever the needs are in your courts. Certain staff that handle the documents that have to be ready for the court event. What's your staffing? Uh, next on here would be facility. What's happening with your court building itself, your courtrooms, your corridors, your entry hallway, your court security screening? What's that? What effect does that have on case flow processes? I was consulting in a court that had a mega docket at 9.30 in the morning. Everyone came to that docket for that single hour. That docket had everything from the first appearance event, for those who may be in handcuffs coming in to be seen, those appearing for status conferences or motions, those even appearing for their trial. A mix match, a mix match, 
a, the courtroom was full to the seams. It was very confusing. The lobby was packed because everyone was arriving at the same time. They could not get up to the courtroom in time. That kind of facility issue and practice, even with setting times and security screening, can impact case flow management. Technologies on this list too, it's not represented up here, but technology that you have to do all this for you, to track, to record, to provide information, technology can also affect. How you set your dockets, I just gave you an example of a cattle call docket where everyone come on down at the appointed hour. That can wreak havoc on case flow. And uh, we already mentioned, but justice system partners, do they have any special programs that help or hinder case flow practices? Uh, what about specialty courts? How are those helping or hindering case flow practices? All of those are part of the culture, the organization, and they can impact case flow management. You can also leverage them to help case flow. I wrote up here, these are factors, but they should not be excuses. These are factors in your court, in your organization, but they should not be excuses. Okay, I want a quick show of hands. Think about your court and your case flow management practices. How would you grade them? If you would grade them as wonderful or great, I want you to raise your hand. I see one, one full hand and a half a hand and another half a hand. That's okay because case flow management is something that needs continuous and ongoing management. Do we have any responses in over the chat? For those attending virtually, I would ask you this same question. What do you think about your court's case flow management? Okay, for those who have the thumbs down, somebody call out an answer. Why'd you rate it as a thumbs down, not doing too good? Somebody be brave. Culture, because culture is there, culture is dealing with influencing, and that's, that's reality and that's okay. That's why we're leaders, so that we can figure out how to manage that culture. Okay, for the third hand up here is, I just don't know. We're kind of middle of the range. Who's in that camp? Who would put in the, I just don't know? Several of you, yeah, I just don't know. Middle of the road. This is all okay, thumbs up, thumbs down, I just don't know, that's all okay. That's why we are leaders in our courts to tackle this thing called case flow management. We have, excellent, good, good deal, thumbs up respondent in the chat. Um, we are now going to look at the actual proven practices for case flow management. These have been published in so many different places ranging from books and publications, ICM courses in the NACOM core curriculum. I have organized them in the array that seems to make sense to me, adding in some of my own personal experience. Here is the list of case flow best practices. I will quickly describe each item up here. First on the list is leadership. This includes Commitment, commitment by judges, commitment by the presiding judge, commitment by the court leadership. This includes setting out goals, talking about expectations. This is leadership, the first proven case flow management best practice. Next up is goals. Having clear goals, describing those goals, publishing information about those goals. They can be time goals, time standards. They can be performance standards, which could go to what are our goals for managing continuances? What are our goals for what the events are that lead towards case disposition? This is goals. Next up here is settlement 
or dispute resolution actions. One of the case flow management principles is courts should set processes in motion at the earliest time possible to help a case conclude or help a case identify issues that are, are no longer at dispute so they can be closed out, dismissed, settled, resolved, leaving time and attention for only those items that still need to come before the court. This is called settlement and dispute resolution actions. In some case flow research and publications, this might be called alternative dispute resolution. In some courts, this may be handled by online dispute resolution, ODR. For our purposes here, I have called it settlement and dispute resolution. Next up is an item called case attention or control. This goes to courts that are really paying attention to case flow management. Kick in the attention and the control over the process of cases as soon as they hit the door. Now for many of us that sounds very aggressive, but the more a court can find out what are the issues that dispute here, what is this case all about, the more the court can be ready for the resources that are needed for the case. So this one is called case attention and control. This includes being familiar with your caseload inventory. What's the actual collection of cases you have before you? And how are they doing in terms of how old they are? What's the case group that might be backlog? And backlog in case flow management terms refers to cases that are older than your stated target goal. So if your goal, making this up, is to have cases concluded in 250 days, and you have a series of cases that are 350 days old, what is that group of cases? That is backlog. In case flow practice, if we allow backlog to occur, our whole inventory of cases can feel like it's larger because we have more cases waiting to be seen. And maybe they're waiting because they got continued and reset time after time. So this practice of attention and control, if properly carried out, can help the court keep backlog minimal. The next item up here is events, calendars, scheduling, and meaningful setting. This practice refers to using a real and clear process for how do you set events? How do you calendar cases? Do you do the come one, come all at 9.30 in the morning? Or do you spread them out? Now obviously all these are affected by how large or how small your court is. They're also affected by what's the case type you're dealing with. Working in a high volume traffic court, you are going to have big calendars. Conversely, working in a general jurisdiction trial court handling complex civil litigation, you may not have as many cases set at the same time. But the structure of the calendar and the docket and the scheduling is a best practice of case flow management. You can decide the structure that works in your court, but some structure is good. Next up here is communication, consultation, education. This best practice goes to, there is no such thing as too much communication about case flow management. Communication on expectations, communication with the leadership judges, communication with the staff, the unit managers, the court division uh, supervisors. What's expected on communication? Communication with partners in the justice system, stakeholders, others who need to know what the court is doing. Education is part of this as well, because if a court has set out some case flow expectations, 
it really is helpful for everyone in the court to understand that. I was on a consulting assignment in southern Arizona where I was interviewing clerk of the court staff, and all they could tell me is, I received this document and put it in the file. There was a whole element missing about why that work was important, because the documents had to be in file in time for the court event. So education to everyone in the system, even justice partners, helps these practices stick helps them stick. Last up here, monitoring, accountability, paying attention to the performance of your case flow practices. This is where we get into counting. This is where many courts use the court performance measures, court tools for those who know about it, and many other ways to count. These are the purest case flow proven practices. Let me pause. If you have a question, raise your hand and let me address it. Anybody present here? Erica, anything on chat? But I have a you have a question, yes. As far as case flow back best practices and the problems that you mentioned, what problems? Hold up one sec. As far as case flow practices, one problem that I seem to have more recently is case, I'm sorry, staff turnover. And yes. it seems like with all the old knowledge or good knowledge going out, then it's hard to find some new people with, you know, that new knowledge, or at least trying to train those new people. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. And for those watching virtually, I would bet you're dealing with this as well. A problem being staff turnover, keeping the knowledge among the camp about what you're trying to do with case flow practices. To me, that means we need to continually be talking about case flow, what we're doing, why it's important. That links us back to purposes of courts, what the techniques are that we're using, so that could be, remember everyone, we're managing continuances. Remember judges, we don't liberally allow continuances. Remember we need the incoming mail or the outgoing notices done in a timely way so that the next event does not get delayed. It relates to those things. Continually talking about that, training, educating. I worked in a court where we had regular dialogue with the justice partners. Now, you could easily do regular dialogue with the court staff, a monthly training, a monthly brown bag, to talk about these things. You cannot do too much communication related to case flow management. I'm walking over here to get a question. And thank you for asking. Yes, it, it's more a comment. Um, I was just thinking another thing that may be helpful is cross-training your staff. And uh, some managers look at it as stretching their employees, but what you're really do, doing is um, putting a type of succession planning yes. into action, uh, which will benefit your, your courts when you have this mass exodus or uh, you know, staff in transition. Cross-training, that's a great technique. It's very hard to do in courts. Uh, I know a couple of courts that do what's called re-careering. Every so often they move employees from one work unit to another so that their skills are refreshed and they understand more than just their little silo. The court I worked in rotated employees because the bulk of the staff working on case flow were all in the same job description. Now, you got a problem if you don't have that freedom, but think about your system. This is where that grow worksheet can come in handy. What are some of the obstacles I might need to envision? What are some of the challenges I'm going to need to think about to leverage this? Do we have a chat? We do. The first comment from the chat is that legislative changes create case flow adaptations too. Yes, that's a very good comment. Thank you, whoever chatted that. Legislative changes, new laws, new rules can affect case flow. I remember the year in the jurisdiction I worked in where a new law came in changing the liability structure, joint and several liability, 
in civil cases. We had to be ready for an influx of cases right before the new law because all of the companies knew it was coming. What's going on like that in your jurisdiction? I guarantee there are things occurring. And this is on top of staff turnover, staff training, staff absenteeism, COVID. In our next session, we're going to talk about COVID. This is on top of all those things. I like to say that these practices, case flow management, need ongoing attention and management in the same way we manage our court budgets. Every month, every week. In the same way we manage our court personnel. We're always paying attention. How are they performing? What's their attendance like? How's the health of our workforce? Case flow should have the same attention. A chat? The question is, what is the most important component to consider when you're working towards case flow management practices with staff turnover or limited staff? Anybody want to take a guess on an answer for that? What's the most important thing to think about dealing with limits of staff, staff turnover? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes. For me, I would say leadership. Leadership, that's a good answer. Leadership, which could encompass almost everything else up here. Leadership could also include communication, which would have been my first answer. Be talking about what's our court stand for? What are we doing to practice case flow management? Why is this important? So these are the case flow best practices. Proven, researched, they work, but they need ongoing attention. Here's a list of some additional best practices that have occurred to me over the years. And they include things like evaluation, continually pay attention, evaluate, measure, publish, talk, share. Uh, talk about court case flow management practices with your justice partners. Don't just keep it in house. Talk about your initiatives that you're going to start for case flow management. Don't surprise the prosecutor with some new policy. Don't surprise the public defender. Don't surprise the private civil lawyers. The court I worked in had monthly meetings of these stakeholders. Sometimes they were uncomfortable. Sometimes they were less than 100% productive. But it falls under the category of communication and exerting leadership and having the court be the primary agency responsible for the flow of cases. That was on an earlier slide. These additional best practices include take stock of the culture. We mentioned that a couple of times now. Be aware and anticipate problems. In the early session today, talking about Ebola, one of the comments shared by the faculty was, you don't have to be perfect, but be paying attention to what's happening. Anticipate and communicate, they said. Well, we've got that included here in a best practice. Next up here is problem diagnosis and solving. That is know what's going on. And back to the idea of training staff. Have we trained our court staff to understand the sequence of events that happens in a case type. Many, many courts haven't. Have we trained our managers? Judges know this because they're sitting over the cases, they're presiding, they're looking at documents. They know what event follows what and what needs to happen before the case moves to conclusion. Sometimes our staff do not know that. Training can help that. That can help you also diagnose where things are getting clogged or bogged down. Next up here is a thing called high performance court practices. Have any of you heard this concept, high performance courts? Some of you have, some of you have not. I would commend you to go Google high performance court framework. 
This is a concept that asserts certain practices by courts that are high performing. I'll come back to this on the next slide. Lastly up here again is mention of performance information. I cannot overstate the role that counting, tracking, knowing performance in all areas of case flow is critical. Added to this list is another set of concepts on procedural justice. Doing things that are fair. Making sure the participants in the court cases know what's expected. Does that ring any bells? Think about all our self-represented litigants. Think about all the people using our courts that dive into this intricate and complex process. We need to help them know what's expected. Treating participants and litigants with respect and dignity and allowing enough time for the participants and cases to have a voice. This is what's known as procedural justice. If you are doing case flow practices, it will help you carry out procedural justice because you will have processes that are clearly explained. You will have time on the docket for cases to be heard so they don't just fall off the radar screen. Okay, let's now look back at the high performance court framework. Here are some concepts and practices that courts that can call themselves high performing use. This comes out of the document and the research on high performance courts. On the left hand side you will see some concepts. Do these sound familiar to case flow practices? They should. Each case gets individual attention. Proportional treatment. Not all cases are created alike. Is a traffic violation the same as a dis dissolution with child support issues? No. Procedural justice, allowing time, allowing the process to be fair, predictable, equitable regardless of who the participant is in the system. And lastly up here, control by the court. Do these sound familiar to case flow practices? They should because they're much the same. Now on the right hand side of this chart you see the idea of measuring. The high performance court framework says courts that are high performing can measure case flow management in these four ways. Efficiency, effectiveness, productivity, and procedural satisfaction. There are measures that courts can use, are using, and tell us about how is the health of our case flow management. These are high performance court practices. They too are connected closely with case flow success. Here is an eye test for you. For those who have the app up, I invite you to look at this in the app. For those who don't, take a look at the screen. For those who are watching live stream, I hope you can get access to this document. This is a document that lays out in our seven case flow practice areas, things that courts actually tangibly do to practice case flow. Let me invite someone, look at this list, and if I could invite someone to call out an item that catches your eye from this list, anywhere on the list. An item that catches your eye from this list. Anybody? Yes. Under leadership, ensure judicial support for case flow practices. Under leadership, ensure judicial support for case flow practices. It's a critical one. This is something that courts that succeed at case flow management find a way to do. Maybe it's getting a good charismatic presiding judge who gets followers. Maybe it's by the judges wrangling things out in a bench meeting. Maybe it's by identifying a champion who is really good at case flow management practices and techniques and inviting that judge to share with others. This can be an obstacle. But this is also a trait that courts really 
that excel and really want to pay attention zero in on, ensuring judicial support. One of the courts I worked in ensured judicial support by having this topic on the bench meeting every single month, by having reports that are published showing how each judge is performing. I'm going over here. Do we have a comment from chat? From the chat, seek realistic scheduling. Yes, that's a good one. Seek realistic scheduling. Thank you for offering it up in chat. Is it realistic to set 200 cases at 9.30 in the morning? Is it realistic to set the first appearance type of case right alongside a jury trial that's going to be convened? Now, it might in your jurisdiction. It might. But it might not. These are things I would invite you to think about. So you've been speaking in previous sessions about the importance of communicating your measurement. Mm -hmm. And so in the past, we've heard, uh, well, we don't have anything fancy. We can't make it look pretty. And I believe one of the things you have stressed is that even if it starts out as a manual process, get something out there to communicate what's going on. And could you describe how? A court without resources could do that. Very good. Thank you for bringing that up. Not all of our courts can publish intricate data, right? Not all of our courts have great case management systems. Not all of our courts are counting things. We can find ways to count them. Measuring is, helps us do these case flow practices. Measuring can be by tick marks, manual counting, Measuring can be by taking a sampling, go pull some files, go look at 10 cases and see how they're doing. Back to my baby court employee years, that is the very thing we did. We sat down and pulled a sampling of case files and counted. When was it filed? What was the date of the next event? How many times was that event heard? Continuances. How long did it take to get to trial? How many days had passed? How long from trial to final judgment? Those are ways you can count. You can take a sampling. You can work with your IT department, maybe, to get some reports. The absence of those things should not stop you from trying to measure. Measurement informs us where we have problems. Measurement informs us where we need to try some enhancements. Did I answer that? Start small, high tech, low tech, mid tech. If you have to do tick marks, do them. If you have to just do a sampling this day of this month, go do a sampling the same day next month. Start building a pattern. Start collecting the practice. You don't have to have the latest and greatest Sorry, Tyler and Odyssey. You don't have to have the latest and greatest case management system. So measurement is part of this. Measurement and case flow are so intertwined. So the question is, how is your court performing on these things? How is your court performing? Here's our list of the case flow best practices. Here's three questions for you. What leadership activities is your court performing? Would anyone care to volunteer? What leadership activities related to case flow management is your court performing? Do you have regular bench meetings? Do you have training for the bench on case flow expectations? My guess is you have these things in place. So another tip would be inventory what you're doing now and then match them up against this list of case flow fundamentals. Measure what you're doing. Back to this list, this long fine print list about case flow best practices. Go through this list and circle the items you are currently doing. Go through this list and identify. And talk about it with your court. Talk about it with your bench. Talk about it with your funding agency. Talk about it with your stakeholders. Comment. From the chat, monthly meetings with court and prosecutors. Yes, that is a good one. 
monthly meeting with courts and prosecutors. That is one of the practices where you are exhibiting leadership. That indeed is one of them. Okay, the next question up here, goals. How does your court use case processing or case flow goals? How is your court doing that? What are you doing? Does anyone in here want to volunteer something you're doing in that regard? annual case count yes so that you're counting and then you're assessing that count against the goal or the target that's a great one next up here monitoring what steps does your court have in place to monitor pay attention to case flow management and case flow performance what steps yes We have a dashboard that we use that our judges can see um, how old their cases are. It actually turns them red, green, yellow, so they Perfect. know where it's sitting in their time standards, and then they have to do quarterly reporting. That's great. If you can do a dashboard, and many of them are the result of pulling data from the case management system, but they do not have to be, if you can create some kind of a report where you have coded it, red, yellow, green, Red, yeah, red, yellow, green for all systems go to danger. Get it out there. Share it monthly, weekly. Um, I'm aware of courts that publish weekly reports to all of the judges with all of the judges' names attached to their particular set of cases. This can be risky. This can be scary. My advice would be figure out how you do that. Don't just do it and expect everybody to love it. But they issue these reports every month and let the judges look. How am I performing? It sets up a subtle competition. And I have observed that the judges at the next bench meeting will say, well, Joe, I noticed that you don't have any cases over 360 days. How do you do it? And then we get the consideration of case flow practices. Comment. So to piggyback on that, we do a quarterly report uh, aging report, which gives the judges the age of each of their cases. Yes. However, it is not seen by other judges. However, it's not seen by other judges, right. and that's okay. Right. Some courts just can't do that. I know of one court that sends you get your caseload, and the list of the other judges has fictitious, fictitious names. Or all of them are fictitious, and people have to figure out who's who. What's your approach? It is risky if you just jump in and say, we're going to tell everybody what everybody's doing. Yeah. My bias is ultimately that's good, but you have to put your toes in the water. And you have to realize this is going to be threatening to those who have built their career on working towards becoming a part of this court organization, and now you're scrutinizing my data? This can be risky. We are hot in the chat. Danielle says, just as stakeholder meetings monthly, court leadership every two weeks. Nicole says, tracking time to disposition on certain types of cases and the clearance rate. Maria says, case management system reports and ticklers. And Nick says, has a question, what is the most common reluctance to change in the workflow management? Those are all good examples of measures. I commend you to look at all of them. They are included in the court tools measures. What's the most common resistance to change? What do you all think? What's the most common resistance to change? Change? Yes, appearance of loss of control. You don't believe this? Get a piece of paper. I want you to try something. Get a piece of paper in front of you. If you don't have one, improvise. I want you to take a pen and write your autograph. Write your autograph on this piece of paper. Improvise, practice doing it if you don't have paper in this tech world. OK, now put that pen in the other hand and do your autograph. Oh, yeah. How did that feel? Awkward. I look stupid. I can't even write a simple C. Loss of control, loss of knowledge, 
loss of feeling like you know what you are doing. That's a super simple thing. All I asked you to do was put a pen in another hand. When we're talking about making changes in our organizations and making changes related to case flow management, this is challenging. This is hard. This is scary. That takes us to this next set. How about our practice of evaluating and assessing and understanding the culture and understanding we're going to be faced with challenges. So here are three questions for you on this one. What does your court do to evaluate and assess case flow management? Anyone want to call out some practice you are currently doing? What are you currently doing to assess and evaluate case flow practices? Statistics would be a natural answer. Bench meetings, educating the court staff and partners so they can help us assess, sharing reports with some of the justice stakeholders, getting data from them, these are evaluation questions I would invite you to take back and ask your colleagues. How are we doing on this? How are we doing? I'm bringing up this worksheet again. Remember our GROW worksheet? When you think about your case flow challenges, what's a goal that you want to accomplish? Is it to get a written case flow management policy? Using that as an example, what are the obstacles now that you might, excuse me, what is the reality that you have? We don't want any more policy. The judge won't sign it. We can't get agreement. On the other hand, what are some of the things you could do? Strengths and weaknesses. What options can you create for your court? Can you pilot test something? Can you do some educational programs? Uh, in the court that I worked, we had significant case flow problems, backlogs. The lawyers were fully in control of the flow of cases. Only when a lawyer said, I'm ready for an event, did it get scheduled. That is not a case flow best practice because that is not the court serving as the manager of the process. The court engaged a series of educations, trainings, briefings with the stakeholders, Briefings with a prosecutor, private bar, defense bar, that can all be part of this. What we're talking about is moving the, moving the dime, getting our court to understand and use these case flow practices. Let me stop and see if there's questions or comments. Okay, here's a question for you. I have blown through this content. Again, this would be a two and a half or three day course. But based on what you have heard here, what is one case flow practice you would like to go back and consider? One case flow practice you would like to go back and consider. I said consider, that may include, make it happen, anybody. One case flow practice you would like to go back and consider. You are in a safe audience here. We all, we all face these challenges. Yes? More communication between the clerk's office and the judges. More communication between the clerk's office and the judges. Yes. And most of our organizations don't have a simple single chain of command, do they? We got clerk's office, we got records managers, we got courtroom staff, we've got judges, judges staff. Um, a whole cast of characters. More communication can help. And from the chat? From the chat? Reviewing, the age of cases. Reviewing the age of pending cases? Yes. That can be part of your inventory of what is the group of cases before us. And in that group, how old are they? How many are kind of the newbies? How many are mid-range and how many, geez, we've had these cases for a while. Why are they still here? Inventorying, knowing the case age. 
These are the proven case flow best practices. Using that GROW worksheet, I commend you to think about what do you want to change in your organization related to case flow. If you have all this mastered, wonderful. What can you improve upon? If you have none of this mastered, where might you want to start? Here's some suggested strategies. Inventory. We've already talked about inventory. Know what you have. And for that matter, know what your mandates are. Know what your policies are. Know what your non-negotiables are. If you have mandates that put out deadlines and timelines, by golly, are you following them? Many of our courts are not. Link things to goals. Link what you're doing on case flow management to the purposes of the courts, the mission statement, the vision, maybe the strategic plan. Evaluate. This is where I am suggesting you continually scrutinize, evaluate, assess, find ways to get better at case flow practices. Prepare, and sounds like my mic is going out, so sorry. Prepare and evaluate and decide where to act, even if it is small. Decide where to act, even if it is small. On the topic of measuring and evaluating, the strategy says, think about what can you measure, what do you need to measure, what help do you need to measure, and where can you start measuring. So, this concludes our time. Is the mic fully out? Okay. I would certainly invite you to think about how can you take these techniques, I'll turn this one on. How can you take these best practices that I have covered and make them your own in your courts? Where do you want to start? Use that GROW worksheet. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. We will be back for part two of this after the break, where we will be talking about just because COVID-19 happened doesn't mean we can't practice case flow best practices. So I want to thank you all for your participation. Enjoy the break. Remember, if you're doing the champion program, you want to go in the app and fill out the champion structured test so that you can be on record as having completed this course. And remember, there are two handouts related to this session, the GROW worksheet and the listing of case flow best practices. So I'm going to hand the mic to Erica for some concluding comments. And I very much appreciate your attendance this afternoon. On behalf of NACOM, we'd like to thank you, Ms. Cornell, for your words of wisdom. Hopefully, the folks in the chat and the folks here live can implement some of the, some of the methods that you have spoken about so that we can get ourselves together. Now, please go into the app and be sure to rate the speaker and also rate the session. Thank you.